greatness and excellency of, of our Savior that You have given to us out of the abundance of Your mercy and grace and out of the wisdom of Your eternal prescience. We pray now as we seek to uh, give testimony to the certainty of Your being, Your power, and Your glory, that we may be able to bring honor to You, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I was asked uh, for this morning's session to address the question of defending our faith, which of course involves the science of apologetics taken from the Greek word apologia, which does not mean to say I'm sorry about being a Christian, but rather to give an intellectual response or reply to objections that are raised by unbelievers and skeptics uh, through the ages. And I've spent a good deal of my life and of my teaching efforts in this uh, discipline of apologetics, and so I wasn't quite sure how to approach the subject <clears throat> this morning. And after thinking about it for a while, I decided to, to go back pretty much to the basic fundamentals of apologetics, to our starting point and the, uh, uh, the focal point of our reasoning process. And with that in mind, I decided to go back and restudy to some degree the works of one of the men who had a tremendous amount of impact on my thinking in this field of apologetics, and a man whose insights have not only influenced me, but have influenced the whole science of apologetics down through church history. And of course, that man was Aurelius Augustine, uh, the Bishop of Hippo in Carthage. Uh, so many centuries ago. And in rereading Augustine, I was interested anew in listening or reading and contemplating <clears throat> his distinction that he makes and made between reason and faith. Though these two things may be distinguished for Augustine, they must never be separated. Augustine said that reason and faith have what we would call a symbiotic relationship one to each other. And in some sense, we start with faith in a provisional form. When we hear the Word of God, we trust it as far as we can understand it, as far as we know it. But that faith at times is weak and doesn't yield what we would call intellectual certainty or assurance. But at the same time, just as uh, uh, faith is a, a, a provisional uh, a, 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 a embracing of the rational, that faith itself is never to be understood as irrational. That faith, true biblical faith, is at the same time dependent upon the rationality that has been implanted in our knowing process by our Creator as part of the image of God. And so, at this point, Augustine makes a sharp distinction that we all ought to be aware of at all times between faith and credulity. Credulity is faith that is founded on no solid rational basis. It's gratuitous. It's the kind of thing that we have urged upon us by existential philosophers who tell us that faith is antithetical to reason, and to be a Christian we must take a leap into the darkness hoping that somehow the arms of Jesus will keep us from crashing and being destroyed. There is really no virtue in believing that which is absurd. In fact, it is impossible to give true faith and true assent to something that the mind categorically rejects because it is irrational and illogical. And so, Augustine, as committed as he was to faith, was equally committed to the canons of reason, particularly to logic. He understood, as Aristotle had before him, 
that logic itself has no content whatsoever. There's no data or information contained within the uh, laws of logic. Rather, what logic does is function as an intellectual governor to our thinking and to our minds so that if our minds become entrapped in irrational categories, the buzzer goes off and the policeman of logic stands there with a big red sign, hexagonal, and says, stop right there because you're now in error or in falsehood. As Aristotle had said before him, and by the way, Aristotle did not invent logic any more than Columbus invented America, but rather he simply discovered the laws of logic that are inherent in rational discourse. And and, uh, Aristotle defined logic as the organon or the instrument that is the necessary instrument for all science to function. It is the necessary instrument for intelligible discourse. Now, all of those categories of logic were accepted and uh, maintained by the great Augustine. Now, uh, what he wanted to do in his efforts in apologetics was to reach an assurance of our faith that is at the level of certainty. Let me pause for just a second here because in our day, in the main, most apologists uh, in the evangelical world believe that philosophical certainty about questions such as the existence of God is impossible and the attempt to achieve it is a fool's errand doomed to failure. Uh, Augustine didn't share that form of skepticism, nor do I. As an apologist, I've often been categorized and described as, quote, an evidentialist. And let me say here for the thousandth time, I am not an evidentialist. Evidentialism is a school of thought that is based almost totally on an empirical approach to Uh, apologetics, people like my friend in the Lutheran community, John Warwick Montgomery, who argues empirically and from history for the truth claims of Christianity, is an evidentialist. Another friend, Norman Geisler, is also an evidentialist. And as evidentialists, they believe that using the senses, looking, tasting, touching, smelling, and all of that, through sense perception, we can come to a, a, a high level of assurance about the chief truth claims of Christianity, namely the existence of God and the authority of the Bible as His Word. But since those arguments are based upon sense perception and that our senses that we perceive things around us with are never perfect, they're always limited. And because of that limitation, they can never rise to the level of 100% certainty. Now, Montgomery and Geiser, for example, would be convinced that the level of assurance that empirical investigation can get us is of such a high order, giving us such an astronomical level of Uh, probability quotients regarding to the truth claims that they give us virtual assurance or at least uh, moral assurance. It's it's what happens in a trial where the uh, prosecution is not required to give, make a case beyond the shadow of a doubt, but rather to make the case merely beyond a reasonable doubt that reasonable people will be persuaded by the evidence to come <coughs> to the proper verdict. And so that's the approach of evidentialists. Now, I believe in evidence, and I'm certainly the New Testament, as well as the Old, uh, makes appeals to uh, uh, empirical data. Peter tells us that, that what he declares is not carefully defined myths and fables, but we declare to you what we've seen with our eyes, what we've heard with our ears. That's empirical data, and that's very important to the apostolic testimony to the truth claims of the Christian faith. 
But Augustine wanted to go beyond that, and so do I. He wanted particularly at the central issue of the existence of God. And again, a pause. In the Middle Ages, there was what was called in the universities the classical synthesis between Christianity and secular uh, science. And the classical synthesis was this, that all scholarship had to be worked out under the, uh, uh, the generic assumption of the existence of God, because the philosophers such as Augustine, such as Anselm, such as Aquinas <coughs> had so clearly demonstrated with their intellectual skill, the, uh, the, the idea of the existence of God through cosmological, teleological, and ontological arguing that no self-respecting scholar in the university would be very loud in protesting against theism. There were, of course, closet atheists, but atheism was not well respected in the intellectual world because of the classical synthesis. And uh, <clears throat> so, it wasn't until the Enlightenment, the 18th century, that that synthesis began to disintegrate, and with the uh, massive uh, uh, critique that Immanuel Kant brought against the traditional arguments that that classical synthesis tended to fall into ruin, and since that time, attempts to reconstruct it have not been all that successful. But in those days, it was said that in the university, theology was the queen of the sciences, and philosophy was her handmaiden. Now, this is chiefly uh, the part of the way that was approached by Augustine, and I think uh, reasonably so. What he wanted to do was to get beyond the probable to the certainty, because if we can affirm with certainty the existence of God, all the rest of the questions of apologetics become so much more simple. The main two questions of apologetics are the existence of God and the Bible as His Word. If you get those two settled, everything else is just exegesis. And so, and again, in the environment in which we find ourselves today, all of the guns of atheism and the, and the skeptics in our day are aimed at the doctrine of God. They're aimed at creation. If they can come up with a worldview minus the Creator, then anything else goes, and they don't have to worry anymore of the intrusion of the church or of Christian, Christian faith into their playground. And so, this was the kind of thing that Augustine was trying to uh, deal with. And so, Instead of moving from a level of uncertainty, such as sense perception, because sense perceptions are always limited, and Augustine introduced his famous analogy of the bent oar. How many of you have ever heard of the bent oar analogy? A few of you, okay? He would take the analogy, you go down to the lake, and you get in your rowboat, and you put the oars, uh, hang them over the side, and you look down on a bright sunny day, and you look at that oar, and for all intents and purposes, you swear that that oar starts down straight into the water, and then it bends because of the refraction of the light, and everything is playing tricks on your, on your eyes. And so, that bent oar <coughs> illustrated the limitations of uh, coming to certainty based on what we see and hear and so on. And so, he didn't want to start from a, a starting point of uncertainty and try to reach certainty from that level of uncertainty. Rather, what Augustine wanted to do was this. He wanted to start with something that was absolutely certain, something that was logically compelling, so certain that it could not be doubted without uh, being uh, absurd. And so, the starting point for his apologetics, and I believe that the starting point for all apologetics has to be right where Augustine put it, and that is that the starting point is the starting point of self-consciousness. The starting point for all apologetics is self-consciousness. Now, my friends in the Reformed community, 
who reject classical apologetics and embrace various forms of presuppositional apologetics say that if you start your apologetics with self-consciousness, you've already capitulated to humanism. You've already turned your apologetics into a man-centered uh, system by starting with the self, and that they see this as a fatal error for apologetics. And I, my, of course, my response following an, an Augustine is it's the only place you can start. If, uh, if you tell me that my starting point has to be God or God consciousness, and so you're telling me that I have to start with God consciousness? Who is it that has to start with God consciousness? I have to start with God consciousness. So I have to be aware of God as my starting point. Well, how can I be aware of God as my starting point without first being aware of myself being aware of God as my starting point? The only person who can start with God consciousness is God. And since we all know that that's not who I am, that, uh, that starting point is simply not available to me. I had a, this, uh, a, a a kind and warm debate on this point about 35 years ago with one of my presuppositional friends, and, and he was uh, unhappy with my starting with self-consciousness and said that that means that I've already started with the pretense of autonomy. And I said to my friend, John, which John? <laughs> Eat your heart out. I said, show me that the idea of autonomy is analytically contained in the idea of self-consciousness, and I'll abandon this right now. But it's not. In fact, in Augustine, not only is autonomy not included in the idea of self-consciousness, but in Augustine's understanding of self-consciousness, it is absolutely excluded. But the starting point is of all thought and awareness that we are the ones doing the thinking. It's a marvelous approach that Augustine did, and he did it uh, 1,300 years or so before Rene Descartes made a, a whole philosophical system out of it with his famous cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. If you've studied the history of philosophy, usually what you do is that you get to the 17th century and you go through the rigorous doubt process that that Descartes did, and you see that he gets to the conclusion after all this massive analysis and evaluation, he comes to the conclusion, whoo, I am. And you look back and you said, you did all of that just to find out that you are? I mean, what's, what's the big deal? And, and then you go on to the next chapter of, uh, of the history of philosophy and forget about what Descartes did, and then you listen to the empiricists, and they, 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 they challenge that uh, assumption in the first place. Well, I'll tell you what, there's nothing more important I think, in the history of philosophy than Descartes' uh, uh, discovery at that point, because what he was looking for was a foundational premise, something that was so certain that it could not be doubted logically or formally, because Descartes said, it, to doubt my thesis is to prove it. I think, therefore, I am. And if I doubt that, in order to doubt it, I have to think it, because doubting requires thinking, and thinking requires a thinker. So even the argument against the cogito proves the cogito, and it gave what Descartes was looking for, that unassailable foundation, that starting point, a pause again. From time to time, I'll sit down with a pencil and paper, and you know, when I'm sitting in a restaurant, I usually use the menu or the, the uh, what do you call those things, the placemat. And the archives, of, and we have this whole collection of placemats where I write my books and the outline on those placemats. Uh, that, that was before iPads, whatever they are. <laughs> but sometimes I'll write down uh, this, this question, I'll ask myself, what do you know for sure? Because all of the hosts of affirmations that we have in the Christian faith, in systematic theology, our doctrine of God, our doctrine of Christ, our doctrine of salvation, our doctrine of eschatology, all of those things, that what I believe in my, my theological system, I don't believe all articles of the creed 
with equal assurance. Some things I'm more certain of than others, and I think that's true of any theologian. It's true of any person. And so, when I try to do I try to go back to first principles, and I like to write down, what are ten things that you know for sure? Ten things that your mind would never, ever be willing to negotiate, and I'll jot those things down that I know for certain, like regeneration precedes faith. I'm absolutely certain about that. I'm certain that Arminianism is wrong. I'm certain that dispensationalism is wrong. I don't have any doubts about that. I don't worry about that at night that maybe I'm wrong about this. I know I'm not wrong about that. <laughs> you know? Now, you asked me about, am I, do, am I right about amillennialism, premillennialism, postmillennialism, promillennialism? I have all kinds of doubts about those different questions. I have certainties about the person of Christ and, and, and all of that. But one of the things I know for sure is that God exists. And one of the things that I know for sure that gets me to the certainty that God exists, not just simply the probability, is that I know that I exist. Now, what Augustine is saying here is to get to the level a philosophical certainty, you can't get it at the empirical realm. Now, my only connection to the outside world is through my senses. I have a mind, I think, and I gather information from looking, seeing, hearing, observing, all of that. But to get certainty, the only place I can find that is not in the senses, but in the mind in the mind. Now, what is mind? I had a professor once that was making a distinction between the mind and the brain. We know that there's a close connection between the mind and the brain, but we also know that they are not and can't possibly be identical. The brain is not the mind, and the mind is not the brain. And the professor put it this way in distinguishing the difference between mind and matter. And uh, he asked the question this way, what is mind? And he answered it by saying, no matter. <laughs> he said, so then he said, well, what is matter? And he said, never mind. <laughs> So, it's important to understand that distinction. This is critical to the Christian faith because when I die, and I'm not planning for it to be this morning. God may be, but I'm not. And as I said this morning, uh, <clears throat> cemeteries in this country are filled with indispensable people. And, uh, and there's a place for you and a place for me. But when I die, I'm going to leave this bag of bones behind but I don't plan to stop living. At the moment of my physical death, my mind will no longer be connected with my brain, but it will be alive and well, and I will have a continuity of personal existence between this world and the world to come. That's at the absolute center of our faith as Christian people, that the I, the person that lives not exclusively but chiefly in the mind, will continue to live. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you to think, a answer this question, not out loud, but just to yourself. Where do you live? You know, when we meet somebody first time, we usually ask three questions. What's your name? Where do you live? What do you do? So, I'm going to ask you to answer the question in your own mind. Where do you live? Is there anybody here from California? That when you answer that question, where do you live? Did you think in your mind, California? Did you? If you did, raise your hand. Nobody? You? Thank you. <laughs> now, let me ask you two more questions just to help me out here. I need some help. <laughs> Are you alive right now? Good. I'm glad for that. We wouldn't want you stinking up the room over there. 
second question, are you right now in California? But you told me you live in California. <laughs> but you're not living there right now, are you? You're living right where you are. When you say you live in California, you say, my residence is there. That's where my address is, where I receive my mail, that sort of thing. But actually, you live where you are. Hmm? Is that right? Okay, nothing profound about that. Now, where do you live where you are? I think I've already given a hint of that, that where we live chiefly is in our minds. You can look at me and you can see my hairdo and um, whether I'm fat, whether I'm skinny, whether I'm short, whether I'm tall, whether I'm white, whether I'm black, all of those kind of things. And they're all part of the description of R.C. Sproul. But chiefly, who I am is invisible to you. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so what I think about in the interior chamber of my mind is who I am. Now, nobody knows who I am in this world better than my wife. Nobody in this world knows her better than I do. And we have this funny thing that happens all the time that I know what she's going to say before she says it. She knows what I'm going to say before I say it, and we'll both say it at the same time and say jinx and play all those games and, and so on. And I'm tuned into her unique uh, vocabulary at home. I have a little tape recorder that I use to do messages. I call it my recorder. She calls it my speaking to. That's the way she uh, communicates. You know, I, I talk about aerosol cans. She talks about pssst, pssst. <laughs> She's really not given to abstractions like, like I am. But as well as I know her, I know her better than any human being on the face of the earth. I don't know her completely. I don't always know what's going on inside her mind. I often do on Sunday morning at the church when the choir stands up to sing the anthem, and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the choir, and I always think to look down in the congregation to look at Vesta because I know what I'm going to see before I see it. I look down at her, stop me if I'm lying, Diane, you know, and she's weeping. She can't listen to choral music without weeping. It's constitutional impossibility. And so I know it, and I can't anticipate it, but I still don't know why. I still don't know all of the mystery that is put together to make her what she is in that interior chamber of her mind, or what we call her soul. It's in the mind that I have continuity of personal existence. I can remember exactly where I was and what I was doing the day that Japan surrendered, entering, ending World War II. I have vivid memories of that moment. I remember where I was and what I was doing when I heard the radio announcement of the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, that was a long, long time ago, well over a half a century. And in some sense, I'm not the same person I was when I was six years old playing stickball in the streets of Chicago when the war ended. On the other hand, I am that person. I'm still little Sonny Sprawl, who was there in Chicago in 1945. I'm that same person. All kinds of changes, all kinds of growth has taken place. But it's still me, isn't it? And that's not only true for me, it's true for you. And So I'm aware in my mind, not only of who I am today, but also who I was 50 years ago. And I'm also acutely aware in my mind of the changes that has transpired. Now, what's this have to do with apologetics? Well, Augustine, like Calvin did later, said that with the idea of self-consciousness that we have in our own minds, an idea that cannot be disputed, 
an idea that cannot be destroyed, that we understand not only with certainty that we exist through self-consciousness, but with that awareness of the self is immediately presented to our uh, consciousness that we are aware of ourselves as being finite that the idea of finitude is pressed together and locked in with every human self-conscious experience. I know, I think therefore I am, but I know that I am finite. I know that I can remember back to 1945 and even earlier than that. But if I ask myself, what were you doing, what were you thinking in April of 1937? I know with certainty the answer to that question. What I was thinking in April of 1937, ladies and gentlemen, was nothing. And what I was doing in 1937, in April, was nothing because I was nothing. I did not exist. I didn't have a body. I didn't have a mind. Somebody might want to argue that I existed in the mind of God and and His ideas, and that's another argument, another story. But as far as my self-conscious existence, I had none. I don't believe in Bridie Murphy or Shirley MacLaine that I had a previous existence, because if I did, I have no, utterly no awareness of it. And if I have no memory of it, there's no difference between having had a previous life and not having had a previous life, because there's no connection between the two whatsoever. I can relate to the boy standing on the streets of Chicago in 1945. I cannot relate to the nothingness of 1937. I did not exist. And so knowing that I am finite, I know that I am not God. So so far all I've become sure of are two things, that I exist and that I am not God. So how do we get from there to God? Well, Augustine followed the pattern and the steps in this manner. He was thinking that if He exists, then there's only three possible explanations for His existence. And this is exactly the same place that uh, Descartes was going in the 17th century. He said, if I exist, then either I am eternal, I am self-created, or I am ultimately created by something or someone who is eternal. See those three options? Either I am eternal, I am self-created, or I am created by something or someone who is eternal. Now, Augustine said those are the only three alternatives, and I've been using that for uh, 40 years in all kinds of venues of apologetics, and I challenge people to come up with some fourth category. And, and there were all kinds of attempts to do that, but, uh, but again, the rose of any other name is not a rose. People say, well, I believe in… I don't believe in self-creation, I just believe in spontaneous generation. But I said, wait a minute, spontaneous generation is self-creation, and show that to their satisfaction. Or they'll say, well, I don't believe in those three. I believe that the, we're here as the result of the infinite series of finite causes. This was the argument that Bertrand Russell used in his uh, public debate with Frederick Copplestone. And Frederick Copplestone said uh, to Russell, he said, that idea of an infinite series of, of finite causes is unthinkable, it's unintelligible, it's irrational. And Bertrand Russell said, well, I can conceive of it. Well, what do you say to somebody like that? Well, what Copplestone said is it's, it's one thing to say that you can conceive of it, it's another thing to be able to conceive of it. I hear people say to me that they can conceive of square circles, but they're deluded. You know? 
They can't articulate it in any intelligible way because a square circle is a contradiction in terms and an infinite series of finite causes is the problem of self-creation expanded infinitely. That's, that's a, a, an, intelli- a, a, an intellectual problem on steroids. I don't want to knock steroids. They've been keeping me alive the last couple of weeks. I don't have any problem admitting it. My name's not Barry Bonds. I, I took a steroid this morning before I came here so I could do this. All right. So Augustine reduced everything to these three possibilities. Notice the two out of the three. Oh. Uh, Steve, can you jump up here and grab those glasses? This is my caddy. Aren't you going to clean them? <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> so you have these three possibilities, that, uh, and two of the three involve eternal, something eternal. Uh, the one that does not is the idea of self-creation. And of the three options, two things I want to say about self-creation. That is the one that probably 99% of atheists appeal to, to discount the existence of God. Scratch an atheist and you will find an advocate of self-creation of some sort. And the idea of self-creation is of these three options, the easiest one to dismiss, and the one that has to be dismissed because it is analytically false. That is, it's false by definition. It's false because it falls of its own weight. And I've said this many times, and you can think it through. You don't have to be a philosopher to get it. For something to be self-created, it has to be before it is. For something to create itself, it has to be there in order to do the job. And so it's existing before it's existing. It's being and not being at the same time in the same relationship. It is and it is not at the same time in the same relationship, which is a manifest uh, violation of the law of non-contradiction. It's sheer irrationality. It's foolishness. It's really laughable and ridiculous, and yet people with all kinds of academic degrees and otherwise perfectly uh, <clears throat> noteworthy achievements uh, use this kind of thinking all the time. I tell the story about this uh, Nobel Prize winner out in the West Coast who said that we can no longer believe in the doctrine of spontaneous generation. We know now that something does not come from nothing. Ex nihilo nihil fit. If, if there's nothing, you can't get anything out of it. You can plead, you can coax, you can beg, but you can't make it happen because out of nothing, nothing comes. He said, we can't believe in spontaneous generation anymore. We have to believe in gradual spontaneous generation. <laughs> S- stop me if I'm lying. I mean, it's, this is serious stuff. It is gradual spontaneous generation. You can't get something out of nothing quickly. You have to be very patient, <laughs> and if you wait for it, it will come. Yeah. Now this was a watershed statement by this Nobel Prize winning physicist because at the heart of the Enlightenment, at the heart of the disintegration of the classical synthesis was the Enlightenment declaration of the Aufklärung. The thing, the enlightening principle was this that we no longer need the God hypothesis to explain the origin of the universe or of human beings, because now we know that the universe came into being through spontaneous generation, self-creation, something out of nothing, the rabbit out of the hat, without a hat, without the rabbit, and without the magician. No sufficient cause, no efficient cause, no cause whatsoever, nothing. And so, that option of self-creation can be eliminated right off the bat. It's nonsense. Uh, Funny, I had a dream just the other night that I had a formal debate with Richard Dawkins about this stuff. (laughs) This did not happen. This is a dream. This is just a fantasy. 
And in the dream, I went that he was pleading for some kind of self-creation, and I went through this uh, dialogue with him, and I said, please tell me how something can create itself out of nothing. And he paused for a moment, and he looked at me, and he said, well, it just does. <laughs> now, don't, don't say, don't want out of here, go out of here and say that Richard Dawkins ever said such a thing. I dreamt that he said such a thing. <laughs> He's not guilty of this at all. He probably would be if we had this conversation. But, but <clears throat> I said, he said, it just does. I said, it just does? He said, yeah, it just does. I said, Mr. Douglas, do you realize how pathetic that argument is for self creation It just does. And he looked at me and says, why is it pathetic? And I said, it just is. <laughs> and, and I, I turned to the moderator and I said, sir, the defense rests. <laughs> and I said, really? The debate's over. I don't have anything more to say. And neither does Mr. Dawkins. It's, it just is. You know. that's, that's where we are. Well, Augustine understood the impossibility, not improbability, the rational impossibility of self-creation. And I've said it a zillion times. If there ever was a time that there was nothing nothing. The only possible thing that could be here now is nothing. But this is why it's so important for Augustine's starting point to establish self-consciousness. This is why it was so important for Descartes, cogito, to prove categorically, absolutely, mathematically that something is because if something does exist, then that means automatically something has always existed. Now it's just a question of discovering what or who it is who has always existed, always existed. Somebody whose existence is not contingent, not dependent, not derived, not finite but is independent, non-derived, self-existent, and eternal. And that idea forces itself upon us, not in our fingers, not in our eyes, not in our ears, but in our mind. Because in our mind is where we encounter formal philosophical certainty. Augustine, again, thinking in terms like this, talks about mental constructs. For example, mathematical constructs, the simple arithmetic, four plus three is seven. Now, I know that's true. I know it with philosophical certainty. And not only do I know it's true, I know that you know it's true. And I know it's true not only on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but it's going to be true on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I know it's true whether I'm a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a Methodist, four and three or seven. It's a universal truth. It's an a priori truth. It's an analytical truth. It's true by definition. It cannot not be true. It's true by virtue of the strength of the impossibility of the contrary. There is no order of certainty that transcends this kind of truth. And it's that kind of truth about the eternal self-existence of God that we have in our minds. And where does that, self, where does that truth come from? It comes from God Himself. Descartes said that God is the author of our idea of truth. God imposes His revelation of Himself into our minds. Now, we talk in the Christian uh, faith about revelation, and we distinguish between general revelation and special revelation. 
Special revelation is the revelation we get from the Bible that gives us the order of salvation, that teaches us about the person and work of Jesus and how we can be saved. General revelation is that revelation that God gives to the whole world, to every human person. It's general in terms of its audience. It's general in terms of its content. General revelation doesn't tell you about the cross. It doesn't tell you about the ascension. But it tells you about the nature and character of God, His eternal power and deity that He reveals to the whole world. Now, there are two kinds of general revelation, and this distinction is critical. The first is what's called immediate general revelation. The second is called immediate general revelation. Now, when we're talking here about immediate and immediate, we're not talking about categories of time, although they may be involved. When my mother, when I was a little boy and I'd be playing outside in a sandbox and it was about dinner time, she would come to the window in the back of the house and call for me. She'd say, son, it's dinner time, come on in. I'm playing in the sandbox with my cars and the sand and stuff, and I'm absorbed and preoccupied with my toys. And so I delay for a little while. Next thing you know, my mother's up there with her hands on her hips, and she says, young man, you come in this house immediately. I understood what she meant. She meant no dilly-dallying, no delay. Right now, you are supposed to come in here. And so I did. Now, when I talk about immediate general revelation, that's not what I mean. Immediate general revelation is that revelation that God gives of Himself through a medium, like through the newspaper, through the radio, through the television, but through a much broader medium than TV or radio uh, or the newspaper. The medium God uses to broadcast His own being is the whole of nature. As the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 1, the invisible things of God, even His eternal being, eternal power and being, are known through the things that are made. You look at the mountain, you don't see God immediately and directly. You see a mountain. But in seeing that mountain, you see the marks of the maker of that mountain. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows forth His handiwork. You can't open your eyes in this world without seeing a theater of divine revelation mediated through, in, and by the created order. That's why so many arguments for the existence of God historically have been argued cosmologically that God is the cause of the cosmos that we can observe. We can't observe God, the author, but we can observe what He does. We can see His fingerprints. We can see the mark of His artistry in what He produces. And that's very important for apologetics, and I don't want to neglect that at all. But there's a different kind of general revelation, which is called immediate revelation. That is, you don't have to reason through the medium to get behind the medium to the author of the medium. But God makes Himself known directly, instantly, immediately, without means, in the deepest recesses of the human mind. And the Bible confirms what Augustine is saying here, that in his own introspection, in his own thinking about his own self-consciousness, he is driven relentlessly and necessarily to the concept of God, which is indubitable. And so, uh, Calvin, who was a great student of Augustine, argues in the same manner and speaks that every human being, which Paul declares in Romans 1 and 2, not only has the advantage of this theater of immediate revelation outside of ourselves, but we also have the immediate revelation of God in our minds, in our souls, what Calvin calls the inextinguishable sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divine within ourselves. And it's universal. This is why man is not just homo sapiens, but he's homo religiosus. He cannot escape the knowledge of God, because it's not just simply out there, but it's in here. 
I've told the story before. I was once asked to speak to a group of atheists on the existence of God, and I went through their questions and tried to answer their questions. I said, I, I think that you're bringing all these intellectual questions to me, and it's fine, and, and I'll deal with them. But I have to tell you where I'm coming from. I'll put my cards on the table and be absolutely honest. I don't think that your problem with God is intellectual at all. Your problem with God is not that you don't know He exists. Your problem is a moral problem. You hate Him. You can't stand Him. And you do anything you can to get rid of Him. Because that's the biblical picture of how the human condition is. That we will not have God in our thinking. But here's the thing. God will not allow us to extinguish Him from our thinking. We cannot escape Him. We can try to uh, to suppress that knowledge. We can de- try to deny that knowledge. We can try to uh, dim it with all kinds of uh, static and to silence it and all the rest. We can make our, our uh, necks stiff and our consciences uh, of stone, but you cannot annihilate that knowledge of God that presses in the interior dimensions of your mind. And again, that knowledge that God plants in your mind to any thinking person is absolutely compelling. I think, you know, everybody thinks that Aquinas' great strength and his argument for the existence of God was within his his five ways to God, and they talked about the cosmological argument. Well, that was a brilliant thing, but I don't think it it, it, it met the at all, the, the depth of his thinking in terms of God as a necessary being. And what do we mean when we say that God is necessary being? Well, let me just take a moment to unpack that. There are two ways in which we can talk about God as necessary being. God is ontologically necessary, and He's logically necessary. Sorry for that, you guys that are doing the uh, translation there. but. You can handle it, Chuck. You know how to do this stuff. Uh, the, uh, the ontological necessity of God is this. Where Augustine thought about his, his own consciousness, his own self, and he realized that the instant he was aware of himself as a self, he was at the same time aware of himself as being finite. That finitude was part of the uh, content of self-consciousness. And he said that Uh, that he understood that Augustine's existence is not necessary. R.C. Sproul's existence is not necessary. The world could get along perfectly well without me. You don't have to have me existing in order to have a world to study. My my being is contingent, derived, dependent, finite, and all those things I've said, and it's mutable. So my being is not necessary. A necessary being is a being who cannot possibly not be. And if you go back through this process that I've introduced you to in your mind today, that if anything exists now, (coughs) something has existed eternally, and that which has existed eternally (coughs) has necessary being or it couldn't be. And the only being who has necessary being is God, pure being, a being that does not change, a being that's not dependent, finite, contingent, or derived. It has the power of being within itself. Contemplate that, my dear friends, and it'll drive your prayer life to the moon and beyond when you contemplate what kind of being God is. God is necessary being. He's a being who cannot not be, and there never will be a time when He will not be, and there never was a time when He was not. He is. I am who I am always and forever. And not only is his being necessary in that ontological sense, but his being is necessary in the logical sense. Again, if anything exists now, there must be necessary being logically. So that logic requires, just as four and three is seven, logic requires a self-existent eternal being. And if you have a logical requirement, a necessary logical requirement of necessary being, you have philosophical certainty. It's that simple so that you can put on your list of the top ten things that you know for sure, is that I know that God exists. I don't just hope it. I just don't trust it. I don't just believe it. I know it. It cannot not be. And I find that truth 
not by looking at you or talking at you. I find it where I live, in my mind. Let's pray. Father, thank You for imposing Your knowledge upon our minds. We hate it. We despise it. We seek to flee from it. But we thank You that You will not allow us to escape the hound of heaven. Thank you.